1 Corinthians chapter 10. I have several verses that I probably will read and mention a few things about, but just as a text, I will read one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That verse is verse 12. I've thought about these things for a good while now, but I was speaking on some other things, and I thought I would go ahead and go with this. At least this Sunday, maybe it may be more than one Sunday, but First Corinthians chapter ten and verse twelve. Of course, Paul is continuing, and he says, "Wherefore, because of what I've just said, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed." lest he fall. Amen. Now, let me say this, that I would venture to say that most who read that verse, because I know I did for four years, until just recently, I don't think I really understood what that verse was saying. I thought I did. Let me give you what I thought that verse was saying for years. And maybe you can relate to that, but it's, it's not it. I used to think it was basically something along this line, that Paul was warning to say, whoever thinks that he <coughs> is doing the right thing, whoever thinks that he's believing God and following Christ and walking the right way, let that person take heed lest he see him. <coughs> you ever think that? That Paul was merely warning believers about committing sin that ain't what he's talking about first of all says wherefore let him that what what's that next word thinketh Paul here is dealing, dealing with the mind and what a person thinks about themselves the problem is often what we think about ourselves may or may not be true exactly he didn't say, wherefore, let him that standeth take heed, yeah. lest he fall, did he? That's not what he said. But see, I've often thought of that. He's simply saying to believers, be careful unless you fall into the same sins that some of these people did. He's saying that, but far more than that. You think, now let me put it, let me paraphrase. You think you have a standing before God? Take heed. You best be careful. You best give great diligence to this, lest you what? Not just sin, because you're going to sin. Exactly. And I'm going to sin. Yeah. It's not about take heed lest you sin. It's take heed lest you what? Fall. Now, what struck my mind, what revealed this to me, was the scripture itself. There wasn't no revelation that came out of the sky. I woke up one morning and all of a sudden got it. <laughs> That's what a lot of people talk about when they talk about, I, I, was I got this by revelation. A guy just wrote me that here a few weeks ago. I believe the sovereignty of God just like you do, but I got mine by revelation. I should have immediately, a red flag should have flashed up, and I should have left it alone. I didn't. So for two weeks I dealt with it until finally I just quit dealing with it. No, look at what, look at, there's, there's one place this word is used. In this same chapter. That lets us know what he means. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, you best take heed, lest you fall. Look at verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed. And he means exactly what he means there. Yeah. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fail. Same word. Just it's spelled slightly different because it's in a different tense. He's talking about something that's already happened. When in verse twelve he's warning about something that might happen, could happen, but it's still the same word. And fail in one day three and twenty thousand. What does it mean fail? You go back and look how they fail. They fail under the judgment of God Almighty. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, their friends and neighbors took a sword to them. And slaughtered them. Now you think about that. Yes, sir. No, what he says, wherefore let the person who thinks he stands. You think you've got something from God. You best take heed lest you what? Fall. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. 
Well, first of all, there, there are four things I want to try to give. I, won't know if, I don't know if I'll get through these this, this morning or not. First of all, ignorance and grace are incompatible. That's right. You hear what I said? Ignorance and grace are incompatible. They don't go together. Thank God, God's grace does not depend upon our lack of ignorance. Yeah. Amen. Okay? Yeah. Don't get me wrong here. God's grace is not dependent upon my knowledge or my understanding. But, again, I say ignorance and grace are incompatible. Why do I say that? Because look at how he starts at least this chapter. Yeah. Because he says moreover. So now I'm going not necessarily on to something else, but I'm going to add now to what I've just said. Yeah. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. Amen. Right? Yeah. This is what it may not be a phrase often used by Paul, it is still a phrase common to Paul. He did not want God's people to be what? Ignorant. Ignorance and grace are incompatible. I don't want you to be ignorant. But sadly, I'm afraid a lot of God's people are ignorant about a lot of things. Now, there are varying, reason, varying reasons why that's so. But one of the main problems is, is because preachers, those who God Almighty's called to preach, refuse to even talk about some subjects. Yeah, you're right. Or they play games with some subjects. <laughs> or they just tiptoe in some subjects and then they just let it go. Because after all, don't you know, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? We do preach Christ and Him crucified. But that includes every subject of reality in this world in the hearts and minds of men. Yes, sir. Free grace instructs. Look at it. You know this. Titus chapter 2. You know, there is this... They, people don't... I've not, I've not heard preachers say this. But it's almost like you get this aura from, this spirit from them. Well, we're just going to preach the gospel. God Almighty is going to save people by that gospel. And that's all we ever do. Is we, just, we just preach the gospel. We preach the gospel. And then God will teach them everything else. I've almost heard it said almost that way. Let me tell you something. The gospel is the message, but it includes the truth of God in all things. Amen. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation. So what kind of grace we're talking about? We're talking about the grace that brings it, not offers it, not makes it available, that brings it. And I'm not even dealing with that. We've dealt with that here for 20-some years. Earl Cochran dealt with it, that to this group of people even before that. I'm not going into that this morning. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And what does it do? It teaches. Amen. Instruction dispels ignorance. Yes, sir. The only reason it wouldn't is because people are rebellious to the instruction. Yes, sir. Now there may be teaching and some people still remain ignorant, but that's because they're rebellious to the instruction. You're right. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Yes, sir. Does it say that or does it not? Yes, sir. That's what it says, doesn't it? And this is the grace of God. This is that, that, that glory of God that we preach concerning the gospel of Christ. His grace. And what does that grace do? It teaches us some things, doesn't it? It teaches us that denying, now not denying that exists. That's not, uh, when I talk about sticking your head in the sand, I talk about being an ostrich. No, this talk about rejecting it. Exactly. Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly. And that means in any sense. Yes, sir. Now, I've said a lot of things here before. And I've mentioned about wine or beer or liquor or whatever. And the scripture says temperance in all things. But let me tell you this. If you can't be temperate, you know what you better do? You better leave it alone. Amen. Exactly. Yeah. If you can be temperate, then be temperate. But if you can't, you best set it aside. Sir. You know why? Because all drunks will have their place in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Because yes, well, that's what the book says. Yes, Does it not? Yeah. 
And yet you got some preachers who when you hear them preach, it's almost like the only real trouble out there is self-righteous religion. Let me tell you, morality will not get you to heaven, but immorality will damn you. Exactly. That's what the scripture teaches. Morality will not get you to heaven, but immorality will damn you. There are, I, could, I could take time and we could read verse, Mason, after verse, after verse. It says, be not deceived. Those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And it gives a list. Yes. Amen. It's, a, it's a black and white list too, David. Yeah. You know, it's not a gray list. That we should live how soberly and what else? Righteously and godly. Where? In this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem unto him, redeem us from all iniquity. And that's the gospel. Joe just preached it. But what else? Yes. Is there something else to the gospel too? Sure. Oh, you bet there is. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. What? Zealous of the right way. Zealous of good works. Amen. And then Paul tells Titus, and in thus turn telling me and Joe and any other man in that called position, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anybody despise you for it. Amen. Isn't that what he says? Yes. Amen. <laughs> so then Paul says, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let me put it another way. <coughs> be careful. Be careful that you're not what you think you are or that you are what you think you're not. Be careful. Be careful. So first of all, ignorance and grace are incompatible. Grace, free grace, sovereign grace, saving grace, the grace of God in Christ Jesus instructs. And it instructs in every area of life. Amen. Yes, sir. That's right. Free grace sets no borders. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Well, that's true in this subject. But maybe what about that? So that that's, that's one of them unimportant subjects. Let me tell you, if something's unimportant, God didn't mention it. That's exactly if it's mentioned in the Bible, guess what? It's important. Amen. Yeah, that's it. Proof. Point of proof here. There are those in grace circles. You rarely ever hear them teach about the second coming of Christ other than the fact that he is. Yeah. Right? Yep. This book is full of testimony about the what will take place concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, and if it's in this book, it's fair game and it's good doctrine and it's sound teaching. Yeah. And it's needful. Look, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you know it, verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the gospel. Is that what he says? No, not in particular, though it's a part of it. What? But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw or not. Then he goes on and instructs concerning the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, and the coming of the day of the Lord. Amen. It's right there. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning this. That's right. There are no borders when it comes to the word of God. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not even preaching on that this morning. That's just a case in point. Thirdly, thirdly, remember now, ignorance and grace are incompatible. Grace instructs. Grace sets no borders when it comes to the revealed word of God, the truth of God, the scriptures. There's no scripture that ought to be off bounds, in other words. No truth, no fact, no event is to be off bounds bounds or out of bounds none whatsoever exactly. but there's so much disagreement that's because there's so much rebellion exactly. that's all it is it's rebellion because there's so much rebellion amongst us exactly. God's people but thirdly under this heading ignorance is destructive to the soul you hear what I said ignorance is destructive to the soul Romans chapter 10 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Yes, sir. Well, I, well I, thought, I thought the church was Israel, so they're going to be. So what's Paul talking about there? Yeah. See, don't be stupid. There you go. Yeah. I would not have you to be even stupid, brethren, let alone ignorant. <laughs> exactly. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being what? Ignorant. Ignorance can be damning. Yes, sir. You see that? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And I will add this one other thing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yes, sir. Yeah. When a man is wrong on one subject, he will eventually, it will eventually lead to error in every subject. Yeah. 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 In some way, some form, or some manner. You must think you're right. Yeah, I actually do. I actually do. Because that of which I do try to speak, I know it's what this book is teaching. If there are things I'm not sure of, I've, I'd stay away from them. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody's, I've had people, I've had people, people ask, what's the unpardonable sin? All I can say is what is in that book. I don't know much about the unpardonable sin, and I pray God I never do. Amen. That's right. You see what I'm saying? You better pray God you never do either. Because if you commit that sin, guess what? It's unpardonable. You're a goner. Well, how do I know if I committed that one? See, that's what we want to do. Now, let me, here's the second point. We want to, Earl used to say this. And it took me years. I had to learn it the hard way because I'm an idiot. We want to walk as close to the pit. We want to walk as close to the precipice as possible. And just tell me, how far can I go without falling in? He used to warn about that all the time. What ought we to do? Run from the pit. Stay away from the precipice. Don't try to play around the asses being yet. Because it ain't time. You got it? Well, I thought, I thought this was the kingdom. Not in everything it ain't yet. Uh-uh. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, but the kingdom is not here yet, but it will be one day. You play on the cockatrice's den. I said ass's den. You play on the cockatrice's den, guess what? You're going to get bit. You try to lay down with a lion right now, guess what that lion's going to do? He's going to devour you. That's exactly right. Right? Yeah. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 10 again. <laughs> ignorance is the avoidance of difficult realities. That's what ignorance loves to do. Yeah. It avoids the difficult realities. And Paul starts with a difficult one. Think about that. Let's read it. Look at it. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Yeah. Now what cloud is he talking about? That cloud of protection. Yeah. Right? All of them were under the cloud. Yeah. And all passed through the sea. Amen. Dry shot. Yes, sir. They all did. Amen. Right? Yeah. Yes. Every single one of them. Yeah. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Do you see that? Yeah. But even stronger. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? Yeah. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock didn't signify Christ. It didn't typify Christ. It was Christ. Yeah. The, they the script, people use the word theolo, uh, theophany. That is a, a pre-incarnate appearance of God. And there were those. I don't know the exact word, but this was God appearing as a rock. Yep. There you go. That rock was Christ. Is that what that says or not? Yeah. But. Yeah. Do you see that next word? Oh, yeah. And that is a severe one. Yes, sir. But with many of them. Now all. 
but with many of them God was not well pleased for they were what? Overthrown in the wilderness. Amen. Do you see that? As I said, ignorance is the avoidance of difficult realities. The difficult reality is everybody, just because a person's associated with the blessings of the gospel, don't mean they really got it. Amen. That's what he's talking about. That's it. All of those people came out of Egypt. Yeah. All of them were protected by that cloud and by the fire. All of them went through the Red Sea dry shod, but God Almighty left the majority of their carcasses to rot in the wilderness. Amen. Because Hebrew says of their what? Unbelief. Amen. Therefore God said, I swear in my wrath. I think that is God. Yeah. I swear in my wrath they shall not enter therein. Amen. And God put it this way, your carcasses will rot in the wilderness. God don't talk that way to the elect. Amen. Do you know that? That's right. He buried Moses, he buried Aaron. Mm -hmm. They sinned. But some of them's carcasses Mac rotted in the wilderness. They were just left there. Yeah. Left there. In other words, association with whatever you want to mention when it comes to God's things. Whatever. Association with does not guarantee safety. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been a part of this all my life. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Amen. You see, this ain't something to where I say, well, I've got it today. I'm all right for tomorrow, and I'll just do whatever I bless and well please tomorrow. Yeah. It don't work that way. <clears throat> but there's people who think that's what grace is. Yeah. Right. That grace is there so you can play at the precipice all you want. Yeah. That's right. You hear it all the time. Well, if they're one of the elect, they'll be okay. No! If they're one of the elect, God Almighty will call them out of darkness into light. Amen. If they're one of the elect, God will turn them and they will repent. They will move away from those things. Yeah. Right? That's what the gospel teaches. Yes, they will quit following self and start following Christ. Yes. Amen. So association with, and you can put the little ellipsis, whatever. I don't care what, well, I, I believe that gospel for years. Let me tell you, if you don't die believing it, you'll perish. Amen. Amen. You reject it the last day of your life, you'll be rejected of God. Amen. I don't know about that preacher. Right here it is in the book. They all went through, they all were associated with this, but with many of them, they, they died in the wilderness. Amen. Were they, you know, people, well, were they elect? Were they saved? Did they not believe the gospel? Some of them did, some of them didn't. Yeah. That's right. And you know what? Only time told the difference. Exactly. Joe mentioned it, and this is one of the examples. Look, now these things were our examples. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And you know that was exactly what Joe was talking This is talking about that ordeal with the golden calf. Who made the golden calf? Aaron did. But there were thousands of them that were slaughtered that day. What was it, 3,000? Moses came down off that mountain and seen that naked party. And that's what it was. It was a naked party. Yeah. They were drinking and whooping it up and doing what people do when they get drunk and naked. You know, I don't have to explain to you. What everyone's here is old enough to know that. They were having a big party. Yeah. And you know what? Moses took those tables yeah. and crushed them. And then what did God say? Yeah. Let every man gird his sword yep. and go in and out of the gate of the camp and slaughter everyone that is not on God's side. Amen. Is that what happened? Amen. That's what happened. Yeah. There was brothers killing brothers. Yes, sir. There was fathers maybe killing sons, Mason. Yeah. And there was a slaughter that day. Yes, sir. 
Because God has always commanded, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Amen. Always. Always. You see, the flesh loves the rim of the pit. It loves it. But you read Hebrews 3 verses 1 through 19. God says there's some people, this is manifest unbelief when a person lives like that. And God Almighty will kill them where they stand. Yeah. Oh, they may live 90 years, but God will kill them where they stand. You know what? They'll fall yeah. Yeah. under the judgment of God. Let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Verse 22, do we provoke God to jealousy? Are we stronger than him? All things are lawful for, for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Amen. We have warnings, and right here he gives them, doesn't he? Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fail in one day, three and twenty thousand. There was another, tw uh, another one thousand that died the next day. The Old Testament says 124,000. Some say, well, this is 123. There's a discrepancy. Don't be stupid. He says, fell in one day, 123,000. There was at least another thousand that fell another day. That's that simple, Mason. See, people want to sit and argue over the discrepancies in the Bible when all they are is just hating God and his word. They want, to, they want to avoid the what? Difficult realities and try to deal with how many angels can sit on the head of a pen, as Earl used to say. Now the fact is, if you're a fornicator, you'll perish. How do I get there? You're only going to get there in Christ. But if you're a fornicator, you'll perish. You'll perish. Maybe read another one. Neither let us tempt who? Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. You see, not everybody got to look at the serpent and live. Some were bitten and what happened? They died. They died. Some were. Neither murmur. What's that talk about? Belly aching. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Why have you brought us out here, God? Why? To destroy us in the wilderness. And let me read one. I wanted, I, we need to turn to that one. Is it Numbers 14? Turn back there and let's see if that's it. See, people get this idea and they read the, the what I'm going to turn out, the technicalities of the Word of God and they try to live on the technicalities as close to the precipice as they can. And then God's got to take care of me. Now let me read you something. Let me make sure this is it. Yeah, yeah, Numbers chapter 14. <coughs> and in verse 11, this is one of them that Paul says was a warning, an example. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Now, was God stupid in asking Moses for information? I don't think so. No. But he's getting Moses to deal with the facts, the difficult realities. Yes, sir. I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them. Do you see that word? Mm -hmm. Do you see that word? Yes, sir. And will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Now, did God mean that? Bless your soul, he did mean that. Amen. You think you're going to play games with God? Now look, and Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among his people, and that thou, hast, art, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them day by day in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now remember, now Moses said, but God, here's the reality I see. Here's what's happened. You see, what Moses had to come to realize was not every one of them was one of the elect of God. Exactly. Right? Yeah. He was being brought to realize that just because somebody associates with the elect don't mean they are one. Exactly. Now look. 
Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations will have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he swore unto. Was that the real problem? That God couldn't get them to do what he wanted them to do? Huh? Therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. Now, let me ask you, did he slay them in the wilderness? Every one of them that was above 20 years old, he left their carcasses to rot. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. So don't think you can play games with God. Don't think you and I have it so figured out. I'm going to hold God to account. No, you ain't. He holds us to account. Amen. Even our Lord Jesus Christ told his eleven, you don't fear men that can kill your body, but you fear God that can destroy your body. Your body, not, the, not all them out there, your body and soul in hell. Isn't that what he said? Because the Lord was not able. And now, verse 17, now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And let me tell you something, that's the only resort we got. Now he's starting to get it right. You see it? Now Moses is starting to get it right. Because remember, oh God, you can't, you can't destroy this people in the wilderness. People are talking, say so you weren't able to do what you said he's going to do. He did destroy thousands of them. It may have been a couple million, I don't know. They rotted in the wilderness. But yet a handful went into the land. God still did everything he said he's going to do. Did he not? Yes, sir. So you best let him that thinks he stands, you best take heed, lest you what fall like these, those folk fail. Verse 19, pardon I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy and thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And you know what God finally tells Moses, not even right in here, but you know what he finds? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and whom I will, I will harden. Isn't that what he told him? Amen. What he told him, didn't he? You want to know, yeah, I'm merciful and I forgive transgression, but I do it to who I want to. Amen. We have warnings. That's what 1 Corinthians 10, Paul basically says, all that stuff that happened back there, it's a warning to us. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Any such rebellion as this will begin a separation. Now you look at it, about the golden calf, you'll see what I was talking about. Exodus 32, verses 25 through 28. Moses and Aaron, Moses actually, by God, and the Levites come up and stood by Moses, was told to go out and start slaughtering their own kind, their own people. Now I do not advocate that physical today. But you know what? God's people still are to be a separate people today. I'm going to give you some verses. Now I'm not going to take time to read them. But they'll be on tape. You can mark them down. Write them down. Look at Matthew chapter 18 verses 5 through 17. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. Look at Romans chapter 16 verse 17. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 22. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse Verse 3. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 10, and look at 2 John 10, and that's only a smidgen of the many that's there. Yeah. That we still take the word against those who rebel against the truth of God. Yes, sir. In some cases, he said, avoid certain people. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's what he says. He says, don't even eat with certain people. Yes, sir. Is that what he says? Does he mean that? Yes, sir. He means that. Amen. Now I have found that it is true that on many occasions we don't have to do a lot of that because it eventually they will leave. Exactly. But if they refuse to, yeah. you will fellowship me. You will commune with me. It don't matter what. That ain't true. You're right. That ain't true. That ain't the way it works. Oh. I don't care if it's you or me. Yeah. It says the elder that sins, it's a, it's a known thing. You rebuke for all, before all that others may what? Fear. Isn't that what the book says? Yes, sir. This ain't no game. This ain't no game. 
The golden calf shows that. Intimacy, that's the second illustration, verse 8. Intimacy with the infidels. Yeah, fornication. Getting intimate with them. And you know what happened? Remember, was that Phinehas? Remember what he did? He took a javelin. And one of the Israelites, he had him a nice little old gal. Now, and I figure she was hot. She was hot to him anyway. And you know what Phinehas did? He chased them into the tent. And he run them both through the belly. Now what does that mean evidently they were doing? While they were doing their thing, he took the javelin and thrust them both through, <laughs> right through the stomachs. And the plague, it says, was stayed. You think you're going to play games with God? Do I think I can play games with God? It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Complaint against God. That was the brazen serpent. Complaint against God. Oh, I, I remember Ralph Dale talking about, about Jacob. I've had, a, I've had a bad day. I've had a bad week. I've had a bad year. I've had a bad life. <laughs> Things is just so rough. Oh, they could be a whole lot worse. I could be in hell under the judgment of God Almighty where I deserve. Yeah. They could be a lot worse. And believe me, I've been through some tough things. I know what it's like to be at home alone at night and cry yourself to sleep. Why? Not even because of what everybody else has done to you, but because of how ignorant and rebellious you are in yourself. You're right. And that you know you brought most of this stuff on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. But you know what? You best not bellyache against God. Because he'll send a fiery serpent to bite you. And you may live and you may not. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. He didn't save them all. He said whoever looks. Yeah. Whoever believes. Yeah. Was cured. Right? There was thousands of them that died before the serpent of brass was even made. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Don't think you can play games with God. And then the last one, a refusal to believe. A ref that, this was the it was number 14. That's the last one he wore, the last illustration, example he gives us. A refusal to believe. <coughs> it's when the spies went in, remember? Twelve went in. Ten come, ten come back and said, we can't do it. Yeah, exactly. Too big. Too hard a job. We best just cut tail and run. Yep. Right? Yep. Two of them said, hey, God's given us the land. Let's do it. Right. You know what the people said? We believe the ten. We believe the majority. And that's what most folks do. Yeah, you're right. They believe the majority. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And they said, we can't do it. And God said, all right, you know what? You're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to die. Yep. And that's when he told them, 20 years and up, you're going to die. And you know what then they said? We'll go up now. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? They did. And you know what? They died. They lost the battle and hundreds of them died. You see, you believe God when God enables you to believe God or you don't believe God at all. Exactly. You see, you don't believe to get out of unbelief. You believe because God is to be believed. This is what the flesh does. God says, go up. They say, I won't do it. God says, well, I'm going to punish you for not going up. I'll go up then. That's what the flesh does. It's always contrary to whatever God commands. And then tries to take the high road. You know, and let me tell you, that ought to frighten every blessed one of us here. Because faith can be pretended. And faith can also be feigned. And there is also a false faith, or as James calls it, a dead faith that has no works with it. Exactly. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Amen. Now that's just, James chapter 2 is just as much true as Romans chapter 9. Yeah. Amen. It's just as much reality. Amen. There is never, this is the fourth point, there is never any circumstance that gives us reason to revolt. To revolt. Because that's what this was. It was revolting. It wasn't just a David, a fall, a sin. It was revolt. It was unbelief. I will have my way even if it hair lips God. And then God's gotta God's gotta be merciful to me because he said he'd be merciful. 
Oh, did God has God showed you your name in the book? Exactly. Then what have you got to go on? Exactly. Right? You best fear God. No circumstance is ever reason to revolt. Look at it. Wherefore let him that thinks he standeth, him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Don't ever think, but ain't nobody been what, through what I've been through. You're dead wrong. You're not that special that God has to teach you alone that way. There's been thousands of others that's been through the same exact thing. Oh, but if you was where I would, if you was where I'm at, you'd do this or you'd do that. Stop basing truth on ourselves. Stop trying to justify God's truth based upon your reality. Base it upon the reality. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, do what? Get right up as close to idolatry as you can. Just don't mess with it. Is that what he says? What's he say? Run from it. Right? Flee from idolatry. And I figure that includes everything else. The fornication, the griping, the tempting, and everything else. Don't you? Run from it. Run from it. There is never any justification to fall. No, not to fall. Now, sin, yeah, you'll sin. And you know why? You know what? There is a, there is a reason for sin. Because you and I are that bad. You understand that? We're that bad. But there's never any reason to what? Fall if you're one of God's. Fall. What's that mean? To revolt against God. Remember what Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10? And I want to, I want to read it because I'll misquote it. Sure enough, Hebrews chapter 10, last couple of verses, 38, 39. Now the just shall live by faith. No ifs and it's not the just might. They do on occasion. They do at times. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, yeah. any, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back. What? Unto perdition. That's the actual fault. Utter ruin. Yeah. But of them that what? Believe to the saving of the soul. As a believer, you not might fall, you will fall. But you will not fall unto what? You will not draw back unto what? Utter ruin. You can't. If you're one of his. If he's called you out. But if you're not, what? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You see, this book does not give us the names of those who are the elect. It gives us the character of those who are the elect. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yeah. So here's the question. Does my character meet the muster? I realize that's scary. Yeah. But it's meant to be. It's meant to be the very thing, Joe, that keeps me, when I start approaching the precipice, the very thought that the precipice will dam is one of the things, Joe, that causes me to start saying, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. You see, the only answer when you've fallen, and I mean by that sinned, and you think, well, am I one of God's or not? Have you ever felt that way? If you've always been sure, I'm afraid you're probably not. Yeah, that's it. I'm not being mean. I'm telling you the truth. If you never doubted, then you've never really been anywhere, or you're probably not yeah. called of God. Well, let me tell you something. We are so corrupt. The fall of the righteous. So he says, what is it? Fall seven times. He will not be what? Utterly cast down. What do the wicked do? They fall into perdition. They both fall. And the fall in the beginning, I've said this over and over, and I know some people haven't got it yet. Why? Because I see them right up there playing around the precipice. That's why I know they ain't got it yet. The fall in both looks just alike when it first starts. Right? Yeah. The difference is the end game. Exactly. That's what it's all about. 
I mean, Aaron was right there. He made the golden calf. Yeah. Yet God spared him that day. Yes, sir. When 3,000 died by the sword from the hands of their brothers in Christ. Or brothers, I should say. Right? Yeah. Now, how, that's not fair. It's grace. <coughs> That's grace. And you never, ever can demand God's grace. Amen. All you can do is plead for it. Yeah. Beg for it. Cry out for it. Believe God for it. Amen. The only answer is to cry out for mercy. And isn't that what Moses did on almost every occasion, wasn't it? Cry out for mercy. You see, there is no hope for continual defiance. That's right, folks. Don't, don't, don't play games. If they're one of the elect, boy, they'll just... They'll, 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 no, wait a minute. There is no hope for continual defiance. Right. Proverbs 29. Look at it. I know some people say, well, how does that fit with election? Quit trying to make it all fit and bow to what the Word says. Right. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy there will be no grace there is that what that says that's what that's teaching but at the same time go back to Hebrews 10 38 and 39 then. the just shall live how by faith even when you sometimes find your actions failing guess what Christ said about those he gave faith huh Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He didn't know it, but he's going to curse and swear one of them. Yeah. I don't know the so-and-so. Yeah. But he said, I prayed for you that what? Your faith fail not. That was the difference between Peter and Judas. Yes, sir. But it wasn't all. I bet you Peter wondered, I wonder what I am. Yeah. Don't you think he did? Yeah. David, don't you think that's part of the reason why the tears flowed down his face? Do you think he was feeling sorry for himself? I bet you he was scared witless. This one, I've denied the Lord God. He has the right to damn me. Right? Yes, sir. But then what did, what, even our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the first people, when he, he met them ladies, what did he say? Now go tell the, all these other guys. Go tell them, I'm alive. I've raised from the dead. And so guess what? Go tell Peter. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. To tell Peter. Why? Because there is a difference. Amen. The problem is it's not always so visible. Yeah. Remember the fall of the righteous and the reprobate looks just alike when they fall. Yeah. Doesn't it? It's the end game. And you know what? It's meant to be that way so that we never presume on God. Exactly. Never presume. Don't think God owes you grace. Exactly. Oh, I'll go out and do this and God's got to bring me back. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. Well, if I'm one of the elect, he will. Yeah, he will. You will. But you go out there and you play games with God, you will find out what happens. Yeah. Think about, I know David, you look at David, seen that woman, he thought, boy, oh boy. And let me tell you, David's life was full of misery from that point, David. King David from that point on, he seen family members begin to revolt against God, and he seen everything begin to fall apart. And you know what? Mason, even the kingdom, especially building a temple, he wouldn't allow it. Yeah. Right? That's right? Now, is that the way you want to live in this world? Uh -huh. Go play by the precipice. Yeah. Go right. play by it if you want to. See what happens. Yeah. You may be okay. God may draw you back. Or guess what? He may push you in yeah. and damn you forever. Father, Make these things real to our hearts and minds and our souls. May it be that we believe you, not presume on you. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.